So the very first thing that Chomsky tries to do is argue that the kind of ordinary intuitive concept of language we have, that's not actually the thing that we're trying to understand whenever we do philosophy language or whenever we do linguistics. Now it's related to the scientific concept of language, the things we're trying to describe, but he does think that the scientific concept is importantly different from our ordinary concept. Why does he think this? Well, basically the idea, that, and the way he puts it, is that the ordinary concept of language just sort of breaks down in certain, con in certain cer sorts of cases. Or in other places he suggests it's not really coherent. Now, he, unfortunately, he doesn't really say more about what he means by it not being coherent or what he means about it breaking down. But he does give us some examples. So one example he gives is thinking about children who have only partly learned a language. So for instance, if a child is like one or two, obviously they partially know English, but they don't know completely know English. So they might go, in, go around saying things like, I has car, if they're carrying a toy car or something like that. So I think Chomsky's idea here is, well, focus on the kinds of things that this two-year-old might say, like sentences like, I has car. Are sentences like that part of any, any particular language that's spoken by people? And I think the answer is no. I has car is not a sentence of English, it's not a sentence of French, it's not a sentence of anything else that we typically regard a language to be. But Chomsky asks, well, imagine though that all the adults died, and the children, so they, they were never corrected when they say things like I has car, so they grew up and they just kept, kept going and continuing to say things like these. In that sort of situation, it then seems like there is a language that the sentence I has car is part of. It's part of just whatever language the kids end up speaking once they once they grow up fully. But the odd thing here is, seems to be that like whether there is a language that the sentence I has car is part of depends on whether there are adults around who speak English. Once the adults don't, you know, in the situation where the adults die, then that sentence does become part of a language. And I think Chomsky thinks that this is just sort of odd, that whenever we're scientifically studying language, whatever concept we're using, it shouldn't be sensitive to whether there are kind of adults around speaking particular languages in the way that our ordinary concept seems to involve. So that's one kind of example. The other kind of example considers what he calls linguistic errors. So we're familiar with the idea that there are common misconceptions about what certain words mean. And one example that Chomsky gives is the word livid. So the way people use livid suggests that they mean, they think it means flushed or red in the face. People say livid with anger. What they typically tend to mean is the red in the face with anger. But if you consult the dictionary, that's not actually what you'll see the meaning of livid is. It's actually quite the opposite. When you say that somebody is livid with anger, what that is supposed to say is that they've gone pale with anger. Livid really means pale and not flushed. So in some sense, it seems like we want to say people are making a mistake. There are some facts laid down by the dictionary about what particular words mean, and people are not using those words in accordance with their dictionary meaning. But the odd thing Chomsky observes is that if we just sort of burned all the dictionaries and people stopped going around saying, well, livid really means pale and not flushed, then what we would say the word livid means would just change. In that situation, we would say that livid really does mean flushed. It doesn't mean pale, as the dictionaries currently say. So it seems like whether there are dictionaries and whether there are sources of authority that tell us what our words are supposed to mean has some bearing on the facts about what we say that words mean. But I think Chomsky is thinking that for any scientific concept of language, the facts about about a language and what it's like shouldn't at all depend on like things like authority sources and what people and dictionaries say that words mean. So as I said, Chomsky gives these as examples of cases where the concept breaks down or is incoherent. I'm not really totally sure what he means because it's not like there's a contradiction in these cases. That would be one way to be incoherent if the way we use these concepts committed us to a contradiction. But that's not really obviously the case. What I think he might be getting at is that these examples maybe suggest that there's something artificial or gerrymandered about our concept of language. That is not the right kind of concept to use when we want to, when we want to do the science of language. So you have a sense of what that really means, you might think about like the concept of a sandwich. In some sense that's a perfectly good concept. You want to convince yourself of that, well just, just wait for lunchtime. But there does seem to be something kind of gerrymandered or artificial about the concept, because it's, it's sort of hard to define if you think about it. 
So you might initially say, well, a sandwich is like two slices of bread with some sort of something in between them, like meat or some sort of meat substitute or something like that. But for instance, by that, by those considerations, a hot dog is a sandwich. And it's not obvious that we really want to say that a hot dog is a sandwich. Now, you can sort of continue this game and try to give a definition of a sandwich. And there are always these sort of edge cases that sort of seem to defeat it. And you might think your reaction here is that, well, the, the concept of a sandwich, it's perfectly good for our purposes, for like when we want to eat something. It's just not a sort of, a, it's not something that corresponds to like a natural kind in nature. When we're sort of doing the science of the world and doing science and figuring out all the kinds of things that there are, the concept of a sandwich shouldn't appear in science because it is sort of gerrymandered and artificial in the way that we just talked about. So that's at least one way of understanding what Chomsky is trying to get at in those cases. I'm not totally sure whether he would accept it, but I think it's a little bit more accurate than saying it's incoherent or breaks down to say that there's something gerrymandered about the concept of that in the way that might be something gerrymandered about the concept of a sandwich. So he thinks really what we need to do is introduce another alternative scientific concept. And again, to see what he's really getting at, it might be helpful to think about an, an analogy. Now, this isn't an analogy he gives, but I think he might be happy with it. So if you do basic Newtonian physics, you start learning all about forces. And forces are kind of, they're a theoretical concept. We don't, before Newton came along, we didn't have the idea of a force. Now, the concept of a force is related to some intuitive concepts that we have. That's kind of precisely how we're able to understand it in the first place. But the idea of introducing a concept like force is sort of to replace some ordinary concepts we have with a more precise version that we can use to do science. It's not like we're taking our, or our ordinary notions of things like forces and using that to do science. We introduce this, nor this new sort of precisified version, and that's the object of study. And I think that Chomsky would say that's basically what we want to do with language as well. We see that there's all these sort of weird edge cases and imprecision in the concept of the ordinary concept of a language. And so what we need to do, just like we often do in science, is introduce a new, more precise concept and study that instead. We're going to talk more in the next video about what exactly that concept is, because there are two main candidates, Chomsky thinks, for what it might be. But one thing that's important to say now is that Chomsky thinks that whatever concept we choose to study, it's important that it, it is what we might say cognitive in a particular way. Because really he thinks whenever we're trying to study language, what we're really trying to get at is we're trying to understand people's minds or something about their minds or something about their brains at a very high level. So we might kind of vaguely describe that as saying we want, this, we want the concept of language to be cognitive in some way. When we make claims in philosophy of language or linguistics about a particular language, like say we make some claims about how English works or we make some claims about how Japanese works, what we're really doing is we're making some claims about the brains of English speakers or the brains of Japanese speakers, but we say them at a very, very high level. It's a very high level of, of, of abstraction. Again, there are two analogies that kind of might help grasp a bit better what he's talking about, because it might seem really strange at first to think of the idea of describing a language as describing somebody's brain. You might think, well, surely the only way to describe someone's brain is to, you know, open up the brain and look at it under a microscope or something like that. And clearly that's not what we're doing when we're doing philosophy of language or linguistics. We haven't dissected any brains in this class, for sure. But the right way, I think, is to think about it like this. So think about your computer. Your computer is a, is a, is a physical object and various physical things happen in the computer. Electricity enters the computer, it works in the, chi in the chip in the computer in a certain way, and that produces various results. So we can describe the computer at a, very, at a very low level, like what, physically speaking, like what's going on in the chip, what kind of electrical currents are going through the chip, uh, and things like that. But that's not what people spend most of their time doing in computer science departments. What they do in computer science departments is they talk about programs that the computer runs. So they write programs and code, that give the, inst the computer instructions to do various things. And when you think about a computer running a computer program, and you're describing what the computer is doing, you're not giving like a, a, a physical description of what the computer is doing. You're not saying like what the various molecules in the chip are doing, something like that. But nonetheless, if you describe, if, if a computer is running a particular program and you s describe what it's doing at any particular point in time, you are saying something, albeit at a very high level, about what the computer is doing. You're saying something about the computer, even if you're not talking about it 
in the, at the lowest, most physical level. So just to kind of sum all that up, we can try to kind of draw a picture. So let's start by drawing a picture of like the laptop. So when we're trying to describe what a laptop is doing, there are a number of different levels we could be talking at. So we could talk, be talking about just what's going on on the physical, on the purely physical level, maybe even the atomic level. What are the various particles in the processing chip doing at any given time, for instance? On the other hand, think about something much more high level, like opening a PDF. If you want to describe what a computer is doing when it's opening a PDF, well, the thing you don't do is you don't go and say, well, let's look at the chip or the atoms in the computer and see what they're doing. That's not the way we describe what a computer is doing when we describe what it's doing when it opens a PDF. We're really describing it at a, at a much higher, more abstract level. And Chomsky is kind of thinking that the same thing will go for brains and for language. So we can think about the human brain. And we can give a sort of purely physical explanation, a very low level explanation about what's going on within neurons or what's going on with synapses or other things like that, that us philosophers don't really understand that well. That's one level we could be trying to describe what's going on in the brain. But on the other hand, just like the computer, we could instead be describing what it's doing at a much higher level. So just like when we describe a computer as opening a PDF, we're talking about it at a higher, more abstract level. When, we, when we're trying to understand things like understanding sentence, or producing a sentence. These are descriptions of what the brain is doing at a much higher level. We're not making it directly making a description about the neurons or the synapses, just like when we are describing what's happening with opening a PDF, we're not talking about what's going on in the computer chip per se. So insofar as we're describing the brain, it's at a very abstract level comparable to the way that we might be describing a computer when we talk about a computer opening a PDF or something like that. And I think Chomsky would, would agree that when we say things like when we study English, we're saying something about the, the brains of English speakers, those kinds of descriptions of the brains of English speakers are like the descriptions of the computer when we're talking about how it's running a program. They're very quite, they're really quite abstract. They're talking about what the brain is doing, what, like what kind of program the brain is running, and not what like the individual molecules or the, the synapses or the neurons in the brain are doing or anything like that. It's this very high level of description that we're working with. That's what we mean by saying the study of language should be cognitive. It's saying something about the brain. It's saying that there's something about the brain of language users or lang users of particular languages, but at a very high level of, of abstraction. Now that's still very different from any way we've talked about language in this class. We've never, we've never once mentioned the connection between languages and brains or minds or, or really anything like that. So you might think, well, given that that's not how we've been approaching language at all so far, you know, why should it be so important? Why does Chomsky think it's so important to approach language cognitively? Surely he should try and convince us that that's the right way, right way to try and approach it. And I think basically Chomsky's argument here is this, because if we look at nature, we think about languages. In some sense, it seems like language is what we might call a species specific property in that humans are the only creatures that really have languages per se. So remember a few weeks ago, we talked about this idea of productivity, of being able to come up with sentences you've never heard before and to understand sentences you've never, heard, you've never heard before. We can do the same thing grammatically. We can construct grammatical sentences that we've never heard before, and we can understand grammatical sentences that we've never heard before. That kind of property doesn't exist any, with any other creature, as far as we know. Now, it's true that like some creatures communicate to a limited extent, but their languages, their languages or their methods for communication don't have anything like productivity. Productivity, compositionality, these things which we've been talking about a lot in, in this class are really central to language as humans use it. And human languages really seem to be the only ones that have these properties. And so the natural idea is, well, if this is the, if we're the only creatures that can do this, if we're the only creatures that can have productive compositional languages, there must be something special about us, and in particular, there must be something special about our brains that allows us to do this. There must be something that all other creatures lack, which explains why they don't have 
productive compositional languages, what we do. And I think that's the feature that Chomsky thinks ultimately we really need to try to explain at some level. Why is it that, what's special about humans? What is it about us that allows us to have language in this very rich sense where languages are productive and compositional and means that other creatures don't? So that's, I think, why Chomsky thinks that like, we should, whatever the scientific concept of language is, it should be cognitive. Because really the most interesting thing here is this species-specific property of language that we have. Okay, so that's sort of the first step of Chomsky's general argument completed. He talked about this idea of the ordinary concept of language and said it sort of seems to break down in certain cases. My way of trying to clarify what that means is that maybe the concept is sort of gerrymandered or artificial in a way that means it's unsuitable for use in science or unsuitable for use in the scientific or precise study of language. And that kind of idea of replacing an ordinary concept with a theoretical one there is definitely precedent for that. That is definitely something that does seem to happen in science. And then the last thing we said is, whatever, whatever that theoretical concept is, whatever the replacement for the ordinary notion is that we use to do the science or the philosophy of language, it should be cognitive. Whatever concept we pick, it should be such that we can sort of give an explanation at the end of the day why language is specific to humans, why it's only human brains that have the ability to learn productive compositional languages.